believe in and we really like because they give us gifts or money. Uh, the first special person is the Tooth Fairy. And the Tooth Fairy gives you money for your teeth. <laughs> so it works like this. When you're very young, you lose all your teeth, usually one by one. So every time you lose a tooth, uh, you put your tooth under your pillow. And when you wake up the next day, magically, there is money under your pillow. Usually it's a silver dollar. Um, and so you're always very excited to get the money. And it's kind of cool because, it, you know, you're happy to lose teeth. Maybe the only time you're happy to lose teeth your entire life. Um, the other special character we believe in is the Easter Bunny. And the Easter Bunny hides Easter eggs on Easter Sunday. The Easter Bunny is a rabbit. Bunny means rabbit. And uh, on Easter Sunday, a Christian holiday in March and April, we go outside with a basket and we look for eggs the Easter Bunny hid in the garden or backyard or something like that. And there are two types of eggs. There are real eggs, hard-boiled eggs, that are painted on the outside. And often the children decorate those themselves. Uh, and there are plastic eggs. And plastic eggs are hollow on the inside. And you can open them. And when you open them, there is candy or money. So those are the ones the kids really want to get. Actually, it's funny. Sometimes kids won't even pick up the real eggs because they just want the eggs with money or candy in them. Um, and then, actually, I'm sorry, we have one more person, of course, and that is Santa. And everybody knows about Santa around the world. And Santa comes down your chimney on Christmas Eve night, December 24th, uh, and he puts gifts in your stocking. A stocking is a big sock a big red sock for Christmas, and you hang it on your fireplace. And then Santa puts toys uh, and gifts inside for the good little children around the world. So the, the story goes that Santa works all year to make toys and gifts for children, but only for the good children. So you have to be good. If you're a bad child, then you don't get any gifts. But it usually doesn't work that way. So you come down the next day, and you go to your stocking and you're very happy because Santa had come. One other thing about Santa is usually, as children, we leave uh, cookies and milk by the fireplace for Santa to eat. That's like a thank you gift. And it's interesting because when you go down the next morning, of course, the cookies and the milk uh, is always gone. And so I think you can guess who actually ate the cookie and uh, drank the milk. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. So those are our three special people. Uh, that we believe in as children in the United States. I had a really nice day today. It's uh, Sunday today, so um, obviously got nothing to do. Um, so I went to meet my English friend Ben in um, a place called Harajuku in Tokyo, which is um, a great place to hang out in on Sundays anyway. But um, we found this amazing sushi restaurant that we uh, usually go to together every time we meet up. Um, Sunday is usually our day for, for meeting up together because um, he lives in Yokohama, which is quite a long way from way away from me. Um, so I don't ever see him during the week. Anyway, this sushi restaurant we found is the uh, best one I've eaten at in Tokyo. It's one of those uh, ones with um, all the sushi on a little conveyor belt that goes along. But it doesn't just do... Uh, raw fish, it does uh, all different meats, it does little hamburgers on rice, uh, little bits of bacon on rice, uh, melon, salads, and also loads of puddings. We ended up, I think, eating about seven puddings between us today. Um, it's, it's The pricing system's really good, it's done on uh, the how many plates you eat, and each plate is a different colour and that's a different price, and it's so cheap, and you end up just gorging yourself eating loads and loads for really a very cheap price so after that we were both stuffed and uh, left the restaurant went to uh up to uh a place in harajuku where um all the crazy kids hang out wearing costumes had a look around there took some pictures and then walked 
um, along the road together about 15 minutes to um, a place called Shibuya which is um, one of the really good uh, sort of trendy young shopping hanging out places in Tokyo um, just so crowded all the time but today they were having a Matsuri festival on where um, all the sort of people from the local uh, different sort of dojos and clubs get together and um, carry this big heavy thing through the streets all in their traditional Japanese clothes and all like chanting and singing and whistling so that was really nice to see um, we decided we wanted to go to the cinema to uh, see a new film that's just come out so we walked all around Shibuya looking for uh, cinemas and everyone we went to didn't have this film wasn't playing this film so we gave up, up on that in the end and Ben went home and um, I went into the shopping one of the shopping centres in Shibuya looking for uh, souvenirs for my friends because um, it's getting to that time now where uh, I've got to start thinking about that I'm leaving Japan in a month and um, there's just my list of presents that I've got to get for people the number of people I've got to get things for is just getting longer and longer as I keep on remembering more pe more and more people so I've started my souvenir buying now and uh, I think Shibuya, as far as my girlfriends is concerned, is the best place to buy stuff. Okay, Gabrielle, you are a vegetarian. That's right. So you do not eat meat? I don't. No meat, no fish. Okay. Yeah. And you said that you have a garden? Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have the, enough room to have a vegetable garden as well as a flower garden. So okay. I love growing veggies. Oh, yeah. nice. Can you tell us about your garden and, mm. and what you grow and what you eat? Sure, absolutely. Well, I guess in the summertime, I grow a lot of salad vegetables, lettuce, spring onions, tomatoes. And over the winter, whatever grows, pretty much, carrots or cabbages, broccoli. Well, so you grow vegetables all year round? Yeah, I try. I try. I'm not a great gardener, but <laughs> yeah, Okay. Um, and what things do you like to make with these vegetables? Uh, in the summertime, just I love raw vegetables, so salads are great. Um, I eat them with sort of tofu or, yeah, vegetables are good. Okay. Yeah, in the winter, soups. I love making soup with fresh veggies. Oh, what, yeah. kind, what kind of soup? <laughs> ah, well, I don't follow recipes, actually, so whatever veggies I have go in the pot. Um, yeah, okay. tomato soups, corn soups, good. Oh, mm. Cool, sounds good. How do you make soup? Wow. I mean, what, yeah. how, what is your procedure? Okay. Well, basically, I take whatever vegetables I have, chop them up, and cook them, boil them lightly. I like them still crunchy. And then I often add a, a base of some sort, a stock, veggie stock. Now, that's uh, normally a problem for vegetarians, right? Because you can't uh, use bullion. Yeah. The beef cube or the chicken cube. Sure. At home, actually, um, we have a lot of vegetarian products available. So I get some organic veggie stock. Or alternatively, um, I use some spices, some cumin or basil spice. Yeah, or sometimes lentils I cook up. Oh, yeah. Wow. You're making me hungry. That's <laughs> <laughs> good. Mm. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Good no well. problem. You're welcome. My first pet was bought for me when I was still a baby. So I think I, think I was... I think I was less than six weeks old when my granddad bought me a little terrier pup. Um, so as far, you know, as long as I can remember from being very, very young, I can always remember this little dog who grew up with me, really. Her name was Lulu. I think my granddad named her. I don't really know why he called her Lulu, but maybe after an English pop star, or maybe he liked the name, I'm not really sure. But he used to always call her Lula, rather than Lulu. So I'm not too sure how the name came about. But anyway, Lulu and I were about the same age, really. Um, so there wouldn't have been more than six weeks between us. And she was really cute. Very small dog, um, as most terriers are, I suppose. So yeah, quite small and a very small face. So she had really cute features and big brown eyes, from what I remember. Um, so she was really sweet looking. And she was very friendly as well and would, uh, would be very happy when you know, we'd come and take her for walks or just play with her even. Um, so yeah, we grew up together for the most part. Um, I tried to spend as much time with her as I could because she didn't actually live with me, she lived with my granddad still, he looked after her for me. Um, 
But yeah, it was really sad. I mean, as she got older, obviously a dog doesn't live as long as we do. Um, so about the time I was maybe, I don't know, 12 or 13, I suppose, um, you could really see that poor Lulu was getting getting much older and, you know, she'd have more difficulty in walking and she just looked like she'd aged a lot, really. So she finally passed away, I think, when I was about 16. So she lived to be quite old for a little dog like that. Um, but it was really, really sad because we'd spent all that time together and the last few years we'd been living in the same place and everything. Um, yeah, so I was really, really sad when she passed away. Oftentimes, I think, with a pet, you know, when you've had a pet for so long, maybe you don't realise how how really attached you are to that person or to that pet, to that animal. Um, and so it really was a wrench when when she died. It was very sad. Um. Okay, I'd like to talk about consumerism in capitalist and communist countries. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually noticed, but Japan is very, what's the word, consumerized. Everything is built for the consumer. You've got huge adverts, you've got talking trees, you've got people with microphones outside the shop screaming, Irashaimase! And everybody as they go past. Everything is built for advertising, for consuming, for buying, for competing, for constantly making newer and better goods so that people buy them. A complete reverse of this is somewhere like Cuba, which is one of the last sort of communist states around and probably the only place where communism has actually worked. Um, in Cuba, everything's owned by the government, so there's no companies competing with each other for advertising space, sort of trying to outdo each other, driving prices up. Everything's done by the government. Any adver adverts are for the same product owned by the same people. When I was living in Cuba, we tried to explain how, um, in, a, in a capitalist society, how consumerism would work. So I'd like to give you a quick example. Um, in Cuba, there are many people selling really cheap orange juice on the street. Um, it's, they make it from like a, like a cordial, like a powder, which they add water to and then they dilute it and keep it cold and they sell it for the equivalent of about 10 yen a glass. Um, many people sell this. We tried to explain to my host family, okay, if this was, um, if we wanted to sell orange, this orange juice on the street, we would find out the supplier, um, buy all of it, and then open up shop charging three times the price as anyone else. No one would be able to sell any because they couldn't actually get hold of it. The Cubans had no idea why this would be a good idea. We received questions such as, why would you do that? But that would mean no one else could sell any. That would mean you would get all the money and nobody else. We were like, exactly. Hi, Kat. That looks like a lovely salad you got there. Thanks, it is. What's it good? got in it? Um, I cheated and I bought one of those pre-packaged lettuce with herbs and some leftover <laughs> food from last night, but it's good. It's got some couscous and vegetables, some grilled veggies, and then salad and olive oil and vinegar for dressing. Mm, so are you a bit of a cook or a, I don't know, you like, enjoy preparing food? Yeah, I guess so. I wouldn't call myself a cook, but I um, enjoy eating, eating well. Okay, so do you go out much to eat or you kind of stay at home or...? I can't afford it right now, but I wouldn't mind going out every now and then. So say if you had a hundred dollars now, mm -hmm. and you could go to any restaurant anywhere in the world, where would you go? I would go for very expensive sushi. Ah. I think. Something good. And? Yeah. Anything else? What about for dessert? Hmm. One of... Oh, I don't know. One of those fancy restaurants and buy a twenty dollar dessert or something like that. If there is such a thing, I don't even know. Like one of those creme brulee. That's one of creme my favorite. Creme brulee. What's creme brulee? Hmm. Have to ask one of our French friends for that one. What's that mean? Cream. Creme brulee. 
I don't know what's good though. Is it that ice creamy or creamy? It's got, or? Um, what is it? It's that dish. It's a custard with a, um, and they put the heat, a hot, like a flare gun? Oh no, what is it? It's a heat gun over the, the custard and it makes the sugar harden. And then on the inside it's all custard. If that makes mm. sense, it's really good though. It's nice. Sounds really good. Yeah. Oh, so you'll have to meet yourself a Frenchman and get him in the kitchen. Yeah, I have to find one in the kitchen. Oh, well, mm. good luck. Thanks. Thanks for talking to us. Yeah, we'll okay. see you next time. Um, Kwabe, you said that you used to be a bike delivery person? Yes, uh, I was. Uh, it wasn't that very long, but I was doing that for like six months. I Do you remember. mean push bike or motorcycle? Uh, push bike. What is a push? Bike? Push bike's like the one you ride with your legs. Your legs. Ah, uh, no, no, no. The motorcycle. Motorcycle. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, four hundred cc. I forgot the name of the bike, but it was uh, like kind of one really fast. Uh huh. And then, you know what they are doing? They they just go. Okay, if you are sending a letter, a very important document, you want to send it to somewhere really fast very very quickly like for a signature or something yeah whatever it is like and then you call me uh -huh. you call to my company and a company called to my mobile or beeper and then hey Kwabi you go to that place and I got you get the address and I look it up in the uh, my map and I go to your place and pick up the thing and deliver to your receiver Oh, to yeah, to the receiver, to yeah, the to recipient, the yeah, recipient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then since it's the bike delivery, it's always something you've got to deliver really fast. Mm. So, which means it's a really dangerous job. Mm. You know, so many people, my colleague, had a car accident. Oh, and really? Yeah, uh, oh. definitely. If you not you, right? You were okay. Not, not me. Since I thought I, you know, I can have a really big accident if I keep on this job. Mm. That is why I quit. Oh. <laughs> Good choice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, if you uh, do that job for one year, it definitely you'll have one accident at least. Seriously? Yeah. Seriously. Man. Wow. That's like I heard something similar in the in the US. Big truck drivers uh -huh. on average over their career uh -huh. kill at least one person. Yeah. The same kind of thing, you know, I, especially in Tokyo, mm. you know, there are millions of cars and motorcycles and people walking on the street, you know, it's it's really dangerous. And even if you are a safe driver, someone's going to hit you. Yeah. So <laughs> there's nothing you can do. You can run away if you're on the street, you know, yeah. there's, there's no place to run away. And so anyway, that was uh, that was an exciting job. Uh, I really enjoyed that because you are always outside. The rainy days, you know, I didn't like that. But uh, mm. on a sunny day, autumn, spring, and uh, it was great to drive in Tokyo City. Mm. You can go everywhere and meet a lot of people. And so, yeah, I met one person. Uh, he was a manga writer. Uh huh. How do you say manga? Yeah, writer? manga writer. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then the publishing company asked me to take the, how do you say, the document for the next week. Oh, like the, the new issue? Yeah. Yeah, the, the first, first draft or whatever? Yeah, and then he, he had to finish up that one, like, until that day. So, hey, Kawabe, you go to that manga writer's house and pick up the documents he's going to give you. And then you bring, bring that, uh, the, Draft, no. Uh -huh. What do you say? Yeah, I, I to, don't even to know. The publishing draft. company. Yeah. Okay, and I've been to his house, and I had to wait like four hours in front of his door, <laughs> <laughs> because you know you can imagine he couldn't finish up his work. Yeah, yeah. So he, he like in, in every thirty minutes he comes to the door and said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. It's I'm gonna finish it in ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be done in the next ten minutes." And uh, then he, he goes back, and I wait, and I, I just kept waiting in front of the door, and um, actually four hours later, he gave me the manga. Really? <laughs> yeah. Did and you read it on the way? No, no, yeah, I was really tempted, but I couldn't <laughs> do that. And uh, yeah, I brought that to the publishing company. That was so funny.
Uh, cool story. So, Steve, what's the worst job you've ever had? Uh, let's see. Worst job I've ever had has to be Fort Fun in Eastbourne. <laughs> what's Fort Fun? Fort Fun is fun for children, but it isn't fun for the spotty 16-year-olds that have to work there. <laughs> So some have the uh, good fortune to operate go-karts and other things like that. I had the great fortune to work in the tea room with a lo- an old lady called Brenda. Uh, <laughs> what was Brenda like? Bre- Brenda was basically a witch. <laughs> and she had two offspring, which were also going to probably at, at, at witch training school. <laughs> and they'd come round and they'd, they'd gossip. And then, but Brenda would always notice in mid gossip whether I just if I stirred the tea, one revolution there, <laughs> too few, and then she'd be on me basically. So I had to serve ice creams mm. and scalding hot tea from a spitting tea machine that wasn't working properly yeah. from two hatches, one from the one uh, looking out onto the beach and one actually inside Fort Fun. Right. So inside Fort Fun was bearable. Mm. Because, and also, all of this time you have to bear in mind that I was wearing a cowboy hat, a little cowboy <laughs> waistcoat with a sheriff's badge on it, and I had two holstered plastic guns, which I was advised by the manager to like whip out and pretend to shoot any like young kid that came up there. Anyway, that wasn't so bad, having to suffer that indig- you know, mm. lack of dignity. But when it came to serving from the hatch from the seafront mm. where all the surfers would come and get their tea and obviously that provided great amusement for them and uh, anyway to cut a long story short I lasted there about three weeks before deciding fuck it I'd rather be poor for the summer <laughs> than uh, have people going yeah that's him as I walked out that's the cowboy from Fort Fun yep that is <laughs> brilliant thanks Steve that's you're welcome story. okay I'm going to talk about my one wish. Um, I think everybody has one or two things they wish they could change about themselves. And for me, um, I really wish I could sing. Um, unfortunately, I have a terrible voice. <laughs> I cannot sing at all. And in Japan, this is very embarrassing because uh, Japanese people love to go to karaoke, and karaoke is when you go with a bunch of friends to a place, a karaoke bar, I guess, or center, and you get a small room, and inside the room there are TVs, and songs are on the TVs. You can choose what songs to to watch, and then one person sings the song, and everyone listens, and it's very popular in Japan. And it's a lot of fun, but it's really embarrassing because I can't sing. And everybody always says, no, 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 you sing. Oh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Don't worry, don't be embarrassed. But after I sing, my singing is so bad that everybody doesn't want me to sing anymore. Um, So it's also really hard for me because I teach children. And I love teaching children. Um... And when you teach children, you need to teach songs. And so I I sing many, many songs with my students. Um, For example, Itsy Bitsy Spider, or Row, Row, Row Your Boat, or many, many songs. Um, But I can't sing. And so luckily, the kids really don't care. So usually it's all right that my voice is really bad. But uh, sometimes they, they tell me, they say, Sensei, Sensei, uh, in Japanese, uh, your singing is terrible. <laughs> so it's really embarrassing. Mm, but I have to do it. Songs are very important for children when they're little. Um, I think the reason I cannot sing is because, unfortunately, in my country, we don't sing as children. And I really would like this to change. Uh, it really bothers me. I've noticed in Thailand, in Japan, and other countries that I have taught, Children sing uh, in elementary school a lot. And in the United States, we don't do this. And I think it's just terrible because you need to sing when you're little to train your voice so it can learn tones and so it can learn how to sing properly. 
And because I never learned to sing when I was little, it's almost impossible to learn how to sing when you're older. So, um, yeah, I, I really wish I could sing, but uh, I just don't think that it's ever going to uh, be a reality. Where are you from? I'm from a little country called England. Oh, yeah? Where in England? Um, all of it. All of it. I have no hometown. Okay, okay. Uh, where do you live now? Uh, I'm living in Tokyo, in Japan. Right. Uh, what do you do in your free time? Um, so my main hobby is uh, football, or soccer to the Yanks. Okay, okay, football, yeah. Uh, what position do you play? Um, I'm a defender, so usually I play on the right side of defense. What's your favorite thing about defending? Favorite thing is definitely hacking down the striker coming through. If he's too fast, don't worry about the ball, get the man. Okay, okay. Did uh, you hack anybody today? Um, I didn't hack anyone. A few people bounced off me, but uh, no, they're all a bunch of girls. So you did play today? I did play. I played two games today. Did you score? I did score. Uh, can you describe it? Well, I was uh, walking up from the back. There's a nice little corner. I thought, oh, I'll just wait at the edge of the area, see what happens. Ball comes in, defender heads it out, bounces in front chested it down a nice volley into the far top corner just over the keeper's flailing hand beautiful goal <laughs> all right all right do you do those kind of goals often i do those goals about once a lifetime <laughs> so it was a pretty special day for you very special day for me yeah definitely um i'm looking forward to the next one in about five years <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you for that cheers mate uh, Kawabe, can you talk about your first job interview? Sure. Um, first job interview. This is a funny story. And uh, that was the time I took the uh, no, took the interview. Mm -hmm. Had an interview with uh, TV broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And then wow. this is a very famous one in Yotsuya, in uh -huh. Tokyo. And uh, that was a very important interview because the job is interesting there are many uh, there are so many applicants to the same position so and uh the thing is i was late for that interview no and uh i was late for 30 minutes Ooh. it was really bad you know and uh, the reason is um at the time i was working for i was a bike rider uh -huh. at the delivery oh you uh, delivered bike stuff. delivery oh really what did you deliver um, the documents and you know and whatever it is y when you want to send somewhere that thing fast yeah you know, yeah oh cool job that's what I was doing and then um, before the interview I was delivering one thing oh no yeah and then so uh, anyway I was late and in my bag uh, when I was driving the motorcycle I, I put my um, suits uh -huh. and the shoes and everything I've got to wear the interview and I was in rush and uh, I been to the uh, that building where I had an interview and in front of that building there was a McDonald and then I rushed into the, the toilet of that uh, McDonald uh, that was on the first floor and I think you know it was funny if if you are looking at me you know. I, I was wearing <laughs> the, man, yeah. yeah I was wearing uh, like a driver's in mm -hmm. suits and when I came out from the toilet I was in the suits <laughs> like <laughs> Superman and then um, yeah I I changed my clothes uh, very 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 quickly in the toilet and I rushed into the building for an interview but I was 30 minutes late and actually um, I got a great interview with the guys of uh, broadcast station uh, but uh, you know since I was late that was the only and biggest reason I couldn't get that job uh -huh. actually they said that uh, if you are not late I could take you mm -hmm. so it's a funny story now but it, at the time I was so like disappointed with yeah, myself yeah. You know, I'm so stupid <laughs> the job was great yeah I've done that too I think we all do that at one point mm. wow. well, well yeah I learned a lot of things from that experience but you got another job for another TV company after that correct 
Mm, it's not a TV company, but the same kind of job. And uh, it was lucky because since I missed the first one,、mm. I got the second one.、Mm. And that is why I could、uh, join to the World Cup. Oh, cool. Yeah. So. It all worked out at the end. Yeah. Nice. Fortunately. I've been at boarding school since、uh, the age of eight. Um, which is pretty young if you think about it.、Um, the reason I went there was、um, because my family were living abroad and、um, they thought it would probably be better for me to go to school in England.、Um, it was really fun actually.、Uh, at sort of 8 to 13, my first school,、um, I had a great time. I loved it. I hardly ever missed my parents.、Um, we had so much to do. The school was great. They organised all these things for us to do. Obviously, we were there over the weekends. Some of the kids went home at the weekends.、Um, some of the kids went home every day.、Um, but us that had to stay over the weekends,、uh, we always had like, loads of stuff to do. There were rules, obviously, but we were given a pretty free hand within the、sort of、school grounds. We were、uh, left to do our own thing. We had our own like, common areas.、Uh, we could bring in our music. We could, it, was, you know, it was great. And,、uh, Sort of、the only bad memories I really have of that is、uh, having to say goodbye to my parents、um, all the way in Holland where we lived, and I'd have to say goodbye to them at the airport and then fly over by myself to England and get picked up by an aunt and taken to school. Which was that's the only, only sort of thing I can really remember that was、uh, bad about it. But obviously, as you get older, and I moved on to my secondary school, we call it in England.、Um, Yeah, I started to like it less and less. Obviously, as you, you get older, you、um, sort of get more opinions about things, about people, how people should be、uh, brought up,、um, about the sort of freedom you should be given,、um, you know, especially from the ages of sort of、uh, maybe 13 to 16. You're very opinionated and think you know best. But the school I went to、um, was very rules orientated.、Um, i t s very strict, and、um, yeah, as, as sort of other people of a similar age to me started going out,、um, you know, going out to clubs, going out to pubs,、um, and doing what sort of kids of norm, that, you know, normally of that age would do, we were stuck at school and had to、uh, go to bed at like quarter past ten on a Saturday night, which I think for a 17, 18 year old kid is pretty unnatural.、Um, It's not a very sort of, I mean, at that age, I just don't think it's a very natural environment for children to be in. I mean, when I say children, you're not really a child anymore at that age. And you should be learning to, you know, cook for yourself, wash your own clothes, look after yourself. But of course, all of this is done for you at school. However, I have to say, now, now that,、um, you know, I'm living in a different country at the moment, I'm living in Japan. Uh, uh, away from all my friends, away from my family, and it really isn't a problem for me at all. I've just sort of slipped into life here very easily because I'm so used to living alone. Okay,、uh, Kevin, I hear that you're from Wales. Yes, I'm from Wales. Okay, and you're, you're really into rugby? Yeah, I, I love rugby.、Um, in Wales, everybody plays rugby.、Um, in primary school, in junior high school, in high school, we play rugby. And when I was in high school, everybody in my school had to play rugby. All the boys had to play rugby. And it's our national sport. Okay.、Uh, do you still play now?、Uh, I played about five years ago. I played in Japan, in Kobe. The club was called Kobe Regatta Club. And,、okay. and they were very strong.、Uh-huh. And、yeah, but in this country, you play on sand, but in Wales, you play on grass. So it's a lot easier to play rugby. In Wales. Okay.、Um, what's the best thing about rugby?、Uh, violence. <laughs> <laughs>、um, uh, it's, it's very good because you can run and you can hit somebody and、uh, you don't go to jail for doing it. So <laughs>、uh, it, it's the same as if, if you've been to America, it's the same as American football. So、uh, it's very strong and when you practice, you become stronger, your body becomes stronger, and it's just fun. Playing rugby.、Uh, have you ever broken a bone?、Uh, I've broken my nose. I've had、oh. uh, um, about f- 10 stitches in my bottom lip.、Uh, I've broken a finger. But that's not too bad. Many of my friends 
have uh, broken the legs and knees and had problems, but Ouch. not too bad for me. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you. One of my, fr my friends told me that she read a story in the paper today about a man who died from eating mushrooms, which I thought was quite strange because this old man lived in the mountains, I think, or lived in a country area where he would have eaten mushrooms almost every day, I think, or while they were in season at least. So it made me think of when I was younger and I used to go out picking mushrooms with my granddad. So sometimes, around now, around autumn time, when it had been a very, very wet night maybe especially, um, that would be good for finding mushrooms the next day. So we'd go out maybe, or maybe three or four of us, my brother and I and my granddad. Sometimes other members of the family would come too or other children who were around to play. And we'd go picking mushrooms. Um, but... I don't think I ever, well I suppose I did pick up mushrooms, but I think most of them uh, most of them were the same type, so we didn't have to worry too much about about poisonous mushrooms where we were, because I think mostly they were, they were okay, but my granddad would have told us anyway which ones we could pick and which ones we couldn't. So it seems strange to me that a man who, who you know, would have been really familiar with these mushrooms would actually die from it. But I haven't read the whole story, so I'm not really sure what happened. But my friend seems to think that he ate these mushrooms a lot and that it was just a gradual build-up of the poison in his system. Which is kind of an awful way to die, really, especially when you're, you know, when you live that close to, to nature and you're eating well, the food that nature offers you, that nature always offered us. It does seem a bit unfair, really. Um... But yeah, there are lots of foods, I suppose, that can do you more harm in the long run. Um, but in Ireland as well, actually, my mother was really surprised that I'd started eating raw mushrooms. So while I was in Australia, we used to have raw mushrooms and sandwiches, which I'd never had before, but I thought it was quite tasty. So when I went home, I'd make some sandwiches with raw mushrooms, but uh, my mother was really surprised and was wondering what the hell I was doing eating raw mushrooms because we never ate them um, unless they were cooked. So I suppose that was one way as well of ensuring that they were safe to eat, that maybe, well, my mother seemed to think anyway that raw mushrooms were would be quite dangerous. Also, one of my colleagues this morning asked me if I'd ever eaten a, a pine mushroom, which I'd never heard of before, but he was telling me that... Um, that they're a delicacy here in Japan and that I should really try one, even though they're very expensive. He said between three and 5,000 yen, I think they cost. So I'm not really sure what the taste is, but maybe there's something like, I don't know. I think he said there was a really strong smell, so maybe a similar smell to truffles in France or Italy, maybe. I'm not too sure, but it sounds interesting anyway. Yeah, so I think from growing up with dogs, like we always had dogs at home or at my granddad's house. Um, so we were always playing with dogs. So I've never really had a fear of dogs like some people have. And I always considered myself a dog person. You know the way some, well, most people consider themselves either a cat person or a dog person. So that they either prefer cats or dogs. So I always thought of myself as a dog person, although recently in the last year or two, I'm kind of wondering about that because I've I've met some really nice cats. Um, though before I always thought of cats as being too um, too independent, really, and almost haughty or snobby towards people, because they didn't really they don't really seem to need people or need affection as much as dogs do. And that's a really nice part about dogs, I think, is that you really feel an attachment to them and they're so happy when they see you and you can really tell, as long as you treat them well, obviously, that they really love you and, and they look after you. Okay, I'm going to talk about movies. Uh, I love movies. 
I think many, many people around the world today love movies. Um, I probably see one or two movies a week on DVD uh, in my room. Uh, I watch the movies on my computer. So I am a big, big fan of movies, and I watch them all the time. But I have three big complaints about movies, about Hollywood, uh, my country, that I wish that they would change. Uh, the first complaint is that movies have too many guns. Um, this really bothers me. If you go into a video store and you look at the cover of all the movies, almost on 50% or more of the movie covers, there is somebody holding a gun. And I think this is absolutely crazy. Um, in my country, unfortunately, there are many guns. But in reality, you never see guns. Uh, people have guns, but it's not common to see a person with a gun. And in movies, uh, there's always guns and shooting and killing and violence and blood. And I just think it's unnecessary. So I really wish that they would um, not have so many guns in movies and maybe not so much violence. Uh, my second complaint is that the stories of most of the movies today from Hollywood are terrible. <laughs> uh, they're so bad that you can't even watch the movie. I guess most movies now are geared towards special effects and visual effects so the story is often really bad and I think that's just terrible I, I wish Hollywood would make fewer movies um, and concentrate on movies with a really good story like my favorite movie is a movie called Wall Street and it just has a fantastic story um, another movie I really liked was The Paper and also Field of Dreams and both these movies have really good stories and almost no special effects so I think that we don't need so many special effects in movies um, and my last thing, my last complaint about movies is that, or Hollywood, that they stop using only beautiful people uh, every time you see a movie or movie stars it's always really beautiful people but in reality most of us, definitely myself uh, we're not beautiful. Most people look average, so why don't they just use actors and actresses that look average? Um, I'm sure there are many, many really good actors and actresses that just aren't beautiful, and they would do a fantastic job in a movie, and it would be a really good story, compelling story, but they don't get the role because they're not beautiful, and they're not young, and uh, I just think that's kind of sad. I know that movies are the way they are because they are are geared towards younger people but I think there's a lot of older people like myself I'm 35 who would like to see more movies with good stories less violence less special effects good writing and people that look average like everybody else it helps them that I have insight into how somebody learning a foreign language needs things explained because I've learned for myself um, however in some ways it doesn't help because the Japanese learner and the Japanese sort of mind and how they learn a language is so very different from anywhere in Europe or South America so activities which would work really well with a European Western South American audience or sort of South American class don't seem to work at all <laughs> um, due to the differences in Japanese and Western culture. Do you, do you think the whole sort of Japanese schooling system is very different then? It's extremely different. How, how's that? Um, I haven't got a great insight into it, but I think the kids have to work a lot harder here. Um, all, I teach a lot of high school children, and they're often coming to my lesson in between their break between cram school on a national mm. holiday, in the summer holiday, <laughs> when... When I was a kid, I'd be playing in the park and beating up girls up the street with a wooden stick or something. <laughs> and um, do you reckon that's kind of passed on with into the sort of work society here? Like, sort of similar, really hard working? Or? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I think a lot's 
a lot's expect a lot is expected of them all throughout their lives. Um, um, two of my neighbours are both salarymen, and they're often arriving home very very late. Um, and a lot more is expected of the Japanese staff at the school than it is of the Western staff. They'll often ask them to do jobs that take twice as long as what they ask us. I don't know whether that's because they expect that the Japanese staff can do more, or they just think we're stupid, which some of us are. <laughs> cool. Well, at the moment I'm living in Japan and um, life here is pretty different to um, anything that I've really experienced before. Um, I think just because the daily routine is so different. Um, in England, in England, basically, I was really lazy. Um, I'd probably, you know, get up at eight thirty in the morning, uh, leave ten minutes later because I always uh, brush my teeth at work, ate breakfast at work, get to work for nine o'clock, come home from work at five thirty, probably lie on the sofa, maybe watch Simpsons, cook some food, go to bed. And that was the sort of daily routine in England, a very lazy one. I mean, even if I needed to go to the supermarket, which was probably, what, like three, four hundred metres away, I'd uh, get on my scooter to do it. Walking anywhere would just be a massive hassle. And uh, so it was a bit of a shock when I got to Japan and all that changed. I mean, the one thing you have to do a lot of in Tokyo is walk. You have to walk everywhere. I mean, the train systems are absolutely amazing, but you need to walk to get to the trains. You need to walk in between the trains. And, like, when I first arrived, I just... I walked my feet into the ground. Um, after a week, they were aching so badly. After two weeks, they were just... I don't know, it took me at least a month to, like, wear my feet in. They still, still ache now after long walks. Um, but... It's just, apart from the walking, you just, it's just the busyness of life here. I mean, because no one actually lives in Tokyo, because um, it's so expensive. Uh, we all live out sort of in the suburbs, in what are called bed towns. And um, so actually getting into school every morning, I'm studying Japanese here. Uh, I have to get up pretty early just to get onto the train, to then travel, commute an hour in. Um, to get to school on time, which of course I never do. I'm meant to be in uh, school at about nine, which would mean sort of leaving my house at about eight, getting up at seven. I know this is not shocking for a lot of people, but after the routine I had, it was a pretty, pretty shocking experience for me, uh, especially the, the hour commute in on the train where you're packed in like sardines, something that you just would never have in uh, sort of London and the London Underground. Uh, in England where I'm from um, on the London Underground if the train's full people wait for the next train here if the train's full people just push and push until they get on so you can end up being stood never get to sit down just standing for an hour like squashed up like a sardine so by the time you even get to school you're totally tired and then there's uh, school until lunchtime and after lunch I always always say I'm going to come back and study, but I never do. I always just come back and fall fast asleep. Now, Heidi, um, you are from Mongolia, correct? Yes, I am from Mongolia. Now, your country is quite unique in that it's a big country, but you have a small population. That's right. Yeah. How about how many people live in Mongolia? Uh, it was actually two millions before, like, before ten years, but now it's three million, so it's getting... Bigger and bigger. Oh, wow. So the population went from 2 million to 3 million in just 10 years? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Wow. Do you know by any chance of any projections about how big it will be in the future? Oh, probably it's going to get bigger and bigger because actually our government is working for it. And there is a project that called, like, if you give a birth, one child gets this amount of money, so probably they're trying to have more and more child. <laughs> <laughs> so if, uh, if young couples, if young women or women have children, they get money from the government. Yes, that's true. Oh, wow. Um, so is it working? I mean, do, do women want to ha- take advantage of it? Oh, uh, probably. It's not like because of the money, but they, they kind of realize that Mongolia needs more population to make Mongolia a more developed country. So what is the main reason why fewer women want to have children or women are having less children? 
Oh, kiss! It's uh, definitely it's gonna be so hard to for them to take care of the ch- child. It costs a lot, and and this time it's kind of hard to like pay for the tuition fees and other stuff. So probably uh, women are trying like to have a less child because of that. But if you think about the popul- uh if you think about the country's development, it's better to have a more child. So. Yeah, probably everybody has different opinion about it. Right. Well, actually, what age do people usually get married in in Mongolia? Uh for the women, they uh, they get married around twenty four till twenty eight. For the men, they are quite late. Oh, really? Twenty twenty six until twenty uh, thirty two. Has there been an increase in, in in females or women going to college? Yeah, that's uh, that's actually increasing because the family and parents are actually worried about their daughters, so they they help them to go to universities. So in Mongolia, the number of universities is getting increased, so there are more chance to go to university. Okay. Wow. It sounds like uh, it's quite dynamic how how it's working. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Heidi, we're talking about demographics and population. Um, now we actually both live in Japan. So you were from Mongolia. I'm from the U.S. And we go to the same university. You're a student. And I'm a teacher. Yes. Now in Japan, have you ever heard of the term parasite child? Yes, I heard. Yeah. Can you explain what parasite child is? Well. For me, parasite child is uh, even if you get older, you're still living with your parents and not paying for the for anything, just paying, getting money from your parents. Probably that's the the term of the parasite child. Right, exactly. And in Japan, it's also quite a big issue because they have a a, a population that's shrinking, mm-hmm. and so they want people to get married and have children. But lots of children actually get a job. Are professionals like doctors and lawyers even, and they still live with their parents, um, so they don't move out and start families. And these are often called a parasite child because they continue to stay at home. Now, do you have this in your country in Mongolia? Well, I don't know if it's called parasite or not, but then in Mongolia, the young couples are still living with your, their parents and not paying anything as well. And they're just uh, working and making money for themselves and not paying for the pa- family. Well, the reason why is, is in Mongolia, the apartment costs really expensive. And for the young couples, it's, not, it's really hard to afford for the apartment. So that's probably the reason they're still living with their family. Wow, that's interesting. So you're saying that they're actually together like a married couple and they still live with their their parents. Yes, that's right. And you said the main reason is because the apartments are really expensive. Yes, that's really expensive. And even if they get the loan from the bank, they can't pay like less than 10 years. So it's kind of hard to like afford for it. So Actually, that's that's really surprising because as you mentioned earlier, your country is really big. Like you don't have you don't have a problem with land, so you would think that housing would be very cheap. Well, like the land is probably well. The problem is like people are living in the capital city. Even if we have like big land, but capital city is really small, and there are so many people who wants to live in capital city. And the capital city is, uh, land is really expensive. And if you even if you want to like build your own house, it costs a lot. So there are no like not many people who want to live in another city than Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital city of Mongolia. Okay. Now, because it's a big city, is it also hard for people to actually get houses? Yeah. Like they have to live in apartment buildings. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, mainly Mongolian people are living in the apartments. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, wow, that's really interesting to to find out about. It's actually, I think, quite similar in America, surprisingly, these days, where oh. some people, young people, are also starting to live at home. Mm, yeah. So, uh, Clayanne, can you talk a little bit about Carnival in your country? 
Uh, actually, Carnival in my country started a very long time ago, um, after the end of slavery. And now it has kind of changed a lot into a big festival where everybody basically dances in the street wearing very little clothes, <laughs> uh, very colorful costumes, um, listening to music. Um, it lasts for two days. It's called Carnival Monday and Tuesday. And for those two days, uh, that's when we have the big parades in the street uh, with big costumes, small costumes, and a lot of music. Um, the days leading up to Carnival may actually be more important than the two days of Carnival themselves because that's when we have a lot of um, concerts and uh, competitions for uh, Calypsonians. And Calypsonians are people who sing Calypso, which is music that's uh, native to Trinidad and Tobago. And um, we have a lot of uh, steel band festivals and steel bands are like big musical uh, bands who play uh, the steel drums, uh, which were invented in Trinidad and Tobago. So this is a, a national holiday. Everything's closed down for... Everything's closed for at least a week. A week? <laughs> yeah, even before, before Carnival Monday and Tuesday. It's closed from the Wednesday of the week before. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then everybody goes right back to work? And on the following Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Okay. Uh, it started, I think, as a kind of a religious festival. I've seen examples of it all over the world, including Europe. And actually, it started uh, from the Catholic Church. So on Ash Wednesday, people are supposed to go to church and confess their sins and <laughs> get ashes. Um, and I can assume that we probably have a lot to confess after, <laughs> after <laughs> Carnival Monday and Tuesday. Um, so is it usually pretty much the same thing every year, or does it change a little it, bit year it by change, year? It always changes because um, it's not government-run. Uh, the carnival bands, that means the bands of people who parade the streets in different costumes, they're actually competing with each other for, to, get, uh, to win the band of the year, and they're judged on their costumes. So we have um, private owners of bands who design different costumes every year with different themes. And um, they have to portray these themes on the street. And uh, the aim is to win the competition for Band of the Year. And every year, the costumes are different. Actually, Carnival is launched from the year before. So I think this year, Carnival will be launched somewhere in... Um, actually, I think they already launched it last month, July. And so from July, you're going to see all the bands co um, coming out with their costumes on display for people to decide which band they want to play in, which costumes they would like to, to use. Artists start to release their sing their Calypso singles because there's, al there's also competition for uh, best Calypso um, and other different types of music uh, which are not as big as Calypso music in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, so, well, uh, well, what about the food? Like, uh, are there certain foods that you eat for carnival? Food for carnival, no, mm, not particularly for carnival, but Trinidad and Tobago as a whole has a kind of a distinctive type of food because we're mostly Africans and Indians. Our food is always a mix of curry and spicy African foods, which is kind of strange. So, in Trinidad and Tobago, we eat, as I said, very spicy foods. And um, a lot of uh, meat. We love meat in Trinidad. Um, actually, vegetarians, people are usually... It's a strange idea sometimes. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of uh, rice sometimes and pasta. Um, so w when is the next carnival? Uh, next year, February. I don't know the exact dates, but it's always in... It's if you check the Catholic calendar for Lent, it's always coinciding with that season. So, because um, Ash Wednesday, I think, is the start of the Lenten season. So, what what are the religious connotations to the carnival and Catholicism? I think it has lost all religious connotations. <laughs> I think originally it was very religious because um, 
people, they would wear like full dresses. Women mm-hmm. wear long dresses and they'd parade the streets ringing uh, bells, you know, like the priests and incense and things like that. Um, but now there's, it's no more of that. Now it's just basically a big party. Religiously, it, it becomes religious after carnival when people go to church for ashes on Ash Wednesday. But I wouldn't say that there's much religious significance. There may be, originally, when slavery was abolished, there may have been some spiritual significance for the um, freed African slaves because um, carnival was used for them as a time of celebration, of celebration of uh, being free. So they used to dance to a lot of their traditional drums and worship their, uh, a lot of the traditional African gods and traditional religions were also, uh, they were also praised and celebrated at the same time, kind of as the Catholics would celebrate their carnival mass at mm-hmm. the time. All right, and this is actually a holiday that's not just in Trinidad and Tobago. This is in other countries as well, right? Yeah, but I don't think it started in, I wouldn't say that it started in Trinidad, and which is why I like to stress, to emphasize that I think the Catholic Church has a big part to play in it because you will find carnivals in those countries where Catholicism is um, very prominent. This is why Brazil, even, they're uh, Catholic, I think. And um, in Europe, there are many parades. They call them by different names. I know in Germany, for example, in Mainz, in the city of Mainz, they, it's actually called Carnival also. And it developed from the Catholic from a Catholic church celebration. They also have Ash Wednesday celebrations. So I wouldn't say it started in Trinidad, but our particular version of it, with the African drumming and um, and our music, I think that's what makes it unique. Although it is definitely present all over the world. Okay, well, sounds good. Thanks. No problem. So, Kevin, um, I thought we would talk about money today, and you had many interesting stories about being broke. Yes. Um, I have been broke uh, a number of times. Anything particular that you'd uh, like to hear? I've got got quite a bunch. So, tell me, when was the first time you were really broke? Uh, The first time I was really broke uh, was I was... 19, and I moved to New York City. I'd followed a girl that I'd met in Glacier National Park. I was working out there as a singing waiter. Went out to New York, followed her, and uh, I ended up living in in an apartment with three other people, and the share of my rent was $500 a month. Now, that was 20 years ago, and $500 a month 20 years ago to a 19-year-old kid with (laughs) no education, no experience, uh, that was a lot. So I I worked three jobs. I worked uh, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. at the George Washington Street bus terminal and subway station handing out flyers. American Express MoneyGram flyers. Then I would take the subway to Midtown to F.A.O. Schwartz, you know, the big toy store. Oh, yeah, the right. Movie big. Yeah, it's really famous. Dances on the piano. Yeah. And I was, uh, I would wrap presents there. And then I would work there from 11 to 4. Then I would take the subway back down to the village where I was living. And I would work from 6, a, uh, 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, as a waiter and busboy. That's brutal. That's pretty harsh. Yeah, it's really brutal. Well, how I ended up being broke was uh, the restaurant was a New Orleans-style restaurant, and I got fired for talking to the customers too much. Truth is, the customers were interested in the fact that I was from New Orleans, and it was a New Orleans-style restaurant. And for I lasted two more months... And I only had enough money every day to buy a slice of cheese pizza and a pack of cigarettes. And uh, That's it? That's it. One slice of pizza and one a pack of cigarettes. Of, well, and a hostess fruit pie <laughs> at lunch. But uh, one time during lunchtime at FAO Schwartz, I went down to the vending machine and I got my hostess fruit pie and I took a bite in it and it was hollow. <laughs> and uh, there was no fruit in it, and I really had a small panic attack, 
and I called the toll-free number on it, and I complained, you know, you just don't understand how, <laughs> how much of my daily nutritional intake that pie represented. And all they did was apologize, and I was hoping they would send me a case of pies, but they didn't. No such luck. That's right. Um, when I went home, I was probably about 30 pounds lighter than before I left, um, and I was really poor. <laughs> so that's the first time I was really broke. So, Kevin, you were saying that you've been poor, broke a couple times. Uh, you talked about being in New York and being broke. Uh, when else have you been broke? Um, wow. Well, I uh, after New York, the following year, when I came home from New York, I was determined to be my own boss. I had not been in control of my life while I was in New York. It was all depending on other people to let me have a job. And when I lost the job, uh, that really that really hurt. And so when I went home, I decided that I was going to own my own business. And I opened my first business, which was a karate school. And uh, I put a lot of money into it that I had. Uh, I'd worked for almost a year now, saving up. And then, uh, well, I also had a, a small inheritance from my grandmother. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but I ended up losing all of the money in the karate school. Now, did you actually know karate? Yes. Oh, you do? I do. I did yeah, not know course. that about yeah, you. That would have been a strange a strange business to start if I didn't know it. But yeah, yeah, I'd done it. I'd started when I was a kid and uh at the time, at the time, yeah, I was 20, I think 20, just about to turn 21 when I opened it. And I was a uh, Nidan at the time, a second degree black belt. And I'd been teaching at my instructor's school for a while, and he had encouraged me, you know, to go ahead and do it. Um, but it was the wrong location in the wrong town. The town was really poor, and uh, I lost about twenty thousand dollars in six months. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, <laughs> especially to a twenty-one-year-old who, you know. Yeah, twenty thousand dollars when you're twenty-one, you could live for like three years. Right, and not a year and a half earlier, I was flat busted broke in New York and then uh, you know things picked up and I thought that I could really try and make something of it but you know nothing ventured nothing gained and that was the attitude that I had and uh and I found myself broke again so the fact that you've been poor but you were poor both times when you were very young do you look back and are you glad that you had those experiences sure sure I learned a lot um uh, uh, those experiences were valuable. You can't, you can't buy that kind of experience. I and mean, I carry it around with me now. Um, you know, I listen to other people who have business ideas, and you know, one thing that I, that I gain from it is I can tell if if they're going into a business, uh, if, they, if they're going to try and start up a business, and you know, they haven't considered all the things that they really need to consider. I can see the pitfalls that I fell in, and you can try and suggest people to, you know, make other arrangements or to be more careful about this or that, but it doesn't always work out. Sometimes they just have to go out and learn the hard way like I did. <laughs>